Good morning and welcome to Global Healthcast, brought to you by Global Healthcast. In this podcast series, we once a week bring to you news and views about public health, vaccines and vaccination. I'm George Schmidt and with me as always is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good morning to Switzerland. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening to those who are watching us or listening to us today. We are covering today a first documented case with a new recombinant SARS coronavirus 2 variant in a patient who infected another patient. We speak about immune responses to dengue and severity of disease. We look at artificial intelligence to document the hidden RNA viruses. We are having a paper connecting genome sequences with microscopy. We cover meningococcal diseases and the Hutch and acute respiratory infections and the global burden of disease. And here is the first story for today, a documented case with a new recombinant sars corona 2 virus developing in a patient infected who infected another patient. Melvin, what is the story here? Yes, um, this is a, a publication from the Karolinska Institute, Karolinska University Hospital uh, and the University of Gothenburg in, in Sweden and other researchers who are collaborating with them. They sequence the genetic material of SARS-CoV-2 from patients in a hospital and discovered that one person was infected with two different variants of the virus at the same time. This led to the creation of a new recombinant variant, which is a hybrid of the two original variants, and the novel recombinant virus was then directly transmitted to another person in the same hospital. And I think this is very interesting because this is the first time researchers have documented the, the or origin of such a recombinant COVID-19 variant in real time, showing how the virus can combine parts of different variants within a person to create new versions of the, of the virus. Very interesting. So the incubator here is a human being and mm -hmm. he transmits the recombined virus to a second person. Yes. I mean, he's infected with two two viruses, and then the next patient who gets infected has this recombinant virus. That's the way how to work this. Very That's interesting. Right. Yeah. This is known and nicely documented, I guess, for uh, influenza and uh, animal origin influenza. But it's it's very interesting for the first time to see, see this documented with corona and in humans. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thanks for picking this up. And you have another interesting story. We all worry about antibody mediated disease enhancement in dengue, but maybe this is not the cause for severe disease. What is the story, Melvin? Yes. Um, researchers from the Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore found that natural killer T cells or NK T cells influence whether the response generate. Uh, the response generates protective antibodies that neutralize the virus or harmful ones that could exacerbate the disease in future infections. Particularly rampant in tropical and subtropical regions, dengue fever is caused by four closely related but distinct type of the dengue virus. As we know, uh, an initial infection with one serotype does not provide complete immunity against the others. So a person can be reinfected by a different serotype. And secondary infections are a well-known risk factor for developing severe disease. This study shows that NKT cells not only shape the immune response to an initial dengue infection, but it also plays a pivotal role in determining the severity of future infections. Um, and I think this is important because understanding this process is is really crucial because it can lead to better strategies for protecting communities, especially in dengue endemic regions where um, severe infections can strain the healthcare system and impact public health. And I think, you know, before we started recording, we mentioned about the ADE, right? The antibody disease enhancement, which we only talk about antibodies all the time, right? And this paper, I would say that it gives it a, a different point of view um, that, it tells us now that maybe NKT cells are actually more important in uh, really in determining whether the person will have severe dengue after initial infection or not. Very interesting. I have to read the whole story when we finish here. Sounds very interesting. And uh, I think I know the group who, uh, who, is, who was reporting this uh, observation from Singapore. Very, very interesting. 
Using artificial intelligence, this group documented hidden RNA viruses. They used an artificial intelligence metagenomic mining tool in, by existing databases to expand the diversity of global RNA viruses. They developed a deep learning model that integrates sequence and structural information. And they found uh, many putative RNA virus species and 180 RNA virus supergroups. The RNA viruses appear to be ubiquitous and even found in soil in the Antarctica, saline islands, air, foods, and hot springs. I have to admit, I don't understand what AI did here in detail, but the story is, again, what we believe is going on anyway, or we look into something that we had no access to in the past. And all of a sudden, we know there is much more viruses out there than we previously believed. The question is, if this is of any medical concern, at least it may be of concern when it comes to uh, pandemic or outbreak situations in the future. Melvin, any view from your side to this uh, item? Yeah, yeah. so, you know, it, I think, uh, let's say we have bigs, 160,000, over 160,000 RNA viruses, right, species. Um, the question is, how many of them can actually really infect humans or how many of them can actually have some effect on, on humans, right? So I think these are nice to know and, and maybe some groups should actually monitor them, but the impact, we, we don't know, right? What is the real impact? Yeah. Interesting, but uh, we, we learn more, we know more, but we don't quite know if there is a threat behind this. Mm -hmm. I have another story where I have to admit that I don't know the details how they did this, and I couldn't repeat the study myself, even if I had an expert laboratory. But anyway, this group of authors combined microscopy and genomics. And with that uh, technology caused expansion in CETO genome sequencing, XIGS. That allows sequencing of genomic DNA and super resolution localization of nuclear proteins in single cells while these cells are not destroyed by the life. And they applied this technology to patient with porgeria, which is a disease where children uh, are aging very rapidly and very young children look as if they were 70 years old. They characterize how variation in nuclear morphology affects spatial chromatin organization. And with what they found, I guess in the future, one is able to more in more detail explain the pathogenesis of various diseases. So another very interesting story, ready for the future to come. Melvin? Yes. Yep. If you have any additions uh, to this view here, and otherwise we continue. No, I, I think this is really now very interesting, right? Because in on in many many parts of of the medical field now, we always have like genome sequencing for cancer, for infectious diseases, for inflammation. We have now genome sequencing, and I think for some uh, aspects they can be helpful especially uh, if there are really genetic diseases or traits that affect the disease, right? But uh, for others, we don't know yet if there are really clinical impact or clinical significance. Yeah, and here you can see more details why things, why and how things may go wrong and why there is disease. Anyway, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting paper. It is not yet published. It's not yet peer reviewed. It is on a preprint server. Finally, meningococcal disease and the Hutch new recommendations are the old recommendations. And the background is that meningococcal outbreaks occurred after the Hutch in 1987, 2000, and 2001. And that resulted in vaccination requirements, which were successful for decades. Now, in May 2024, 12 meningococcal infections were reported from the UK, France, and the USA, and 10 of the 12 were linked to travelers returning from Saudi Arabia after Umrah. None of these patients had received the required quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine before traveling, despite the fact that it is mandated for pilgrims. 
Now, the first author of the paper is Siad Memish from Saudi Arabia, and he thinks that emergence of antibiotic resistant strains is complicating treatment of meningococcal infections, and he believes that changes in visa requirements may have led to non-compliance with vaccination requirements. So he strongly recommends vaccination. He thinks it should be enforced, that pilgrims should educate it, increase of awareness should be um, aimed at, and global collaboration is needed to make sure that cases are detected early on, and also that the mandated vaccine applications are uh, administered before people uh, travel to the Hajj. By the way, 1.8 million went to the Hajj in 90, in last year, in 2023. So it is a real mass gathering. And these recommendations are really of a very, very big public health concern. Hmm. Melvin, any comments? Yes, I, so I, I think after uh, those series series of outbreaks in the past, we we have this strict recommendations now for everyone going to uh, Saudi Arabia for the Hajj or Umrah, right? And um, we we as I think we see that these are um, really effective, right? Because we don't see as much as uh, in the past now outbreaks that uh, happened and uh, infected many, many people who visited uh, these uh, the, the Hajj and uh, Umrah sites in, in Saudi Arabia. It is a very important matter, uh, and it is a very important matter of public health. Yeah. I have a last piece on acute respiratory tract infections and the global burden of disease. Many pin people believe that the burden of upper respiratory infections and otitis media is minor. And we reported about um, a global burden of disease with respiratory tract infections in the past. And what we usually look at is lower respiratory tract infection because they regularly result in deaths. The death toll from pneumonia in the elderly, even in the Western world, is roughly 12%. And that is unchanged over decades. And in children in low middle income countries, it may be even 30%. So lower is a big burden, but upper as well, because there are so many upper respiratory tract infections. In 2021, there were an estimated 12.8 billion URIs globally. And the highest incidence was in young children, 12 to 23 months. Otitis media, which is already a severe disease, largely affecting young children. 391 million episodes in 2021. Again, the peak is in young children. Now, the authors calculated that the combined burden of upper respiratory tract infections and otitis media resulted in 6.86 million years lost due to disabilities and 8.16 million disease adjust, disability adjusted life years in 2021. So this is really a huge burden of disease, although upper respiratory tract infections are minor. The authors found that the mortality rates for both conditions decreased since 1990, but still, as exemplified in the line above, uh, respiratory tract infections still account for a large number of severe diseases, particularly in low and middle income countries. Risk factors identified were low birth weight, household air pollution, which, which means you have an open fire in your house where you cook your meals and everybody inhales the fumes. And then secondhand smoke exposure. Again, that were the major contributors to disease birth. Melvin, any views from your side on this topic? Yes. So I just wanted to say that the Global burden of disease of acute respiratory tract infection is really huge. We should not forget about that. We have vaccines for some of them, flu, RSV, pneumococcus, but it's also good, I think, to do something about air pollution and secondhand smoke, which is written here. Yeah, very good point. And we know what to do, but it needs to get done, right? Mm -hmm. Melvin, with that, I can summarize what we talked about today. A new recombinant SARS coronavirus 2 variant that developed in one patient and then infected another one. We spoke about natural killer cells to predict the dengue risk severity of infection. 
We spoke about artificial intelligence to document the hidden RNA virus sphere. Many more virus species out there that we don't didn't know about so far. We looked at connecting genome sequences in a live cell with microscopy, which allows us to better understand the pathogenesis of diseases. We came up with the meningococcal disease recommendations for the Hutch and that travelers to the Hutch should really follow them for their own health, but also for the health of others. And finally, we looked into the global burden of upper respiratory tract infections, which are not as severe as lower respiratory tract infections, but due to the very high number, they play a very high public health role. With that, I come to our last slide, which is what does my morning look like today? And what you see here, if you're working in a hospital, it will be a long day and you know already and you don't need even to ask, right? You know what's going to happen on each particular day. It's a nightmare. Anyway, with that, I close for today and I have hand over to Melvin. You have the last word. So thank you very much again, everyone, for listening and watching us. Stay safe.